We wanted to take predatory travel routes, ridge lines, elk calving areas, game trails, and do a very comprehensive camera track project. And that's what the Olympic project was when it started. And so those five guys right there, we, had, we were operating over 50 cameras. And a lot of these cameras were in very remote places. So it was a, it was a tall job. It was a lot of fun, too. This is Wally Hurson. Wally Hurson is our benefactor. And for lack of a better word, he's a rich guy that lives in California. He's very interested in Bigfoot. And he's a, he's a fantastic man. He doesn't pay us to be out in the woods, but what he does do is he supplies our all of our technological gear. He buys all th our, he buys our thermal imagery stuff. He buys our game cameras, our night vision. So he, he puts all that stuff in our hands. And uh, very generous man. He kind of stays out of the limelight. And uh, I just think the world of him. So just some pictures here of what we were doing in the beginning. We would go out, and when we started doing this, we didn't take much precautions to try to hide cameras because we were all on a learning curve. We would just put them on a tree and hope for the best. And we ended up getting a whole lot of fantastic pictures, just basically tens of thousands of about every species that lives in the Olympic National Forest and the Olympic National Park. So this gives you an example of the topography in the Olympics. In a lot of cases like this, we would have cameras right along those ridge lines. Or in any, any, when you get up to a mountain like this, the easiest way to travel on that mountain is along the ridge line. Uh, it's, as you can see on the side hills, it's just impossible. But if you put cameras on those ridge lines, you would be amazed at the amount of game that uses the ridge lines to go from point A to point B. It's the most efficient way to travel through a mountain range along the ridge lines if you can get to them. And it's also a predator hotspot. We've documented over 24 cougars on these ridge lines, which you'll see here in a second. And it's just, it's just really, really challenging doing this work in the Olympics because of the steepness, but it's also a lot of fun. This is, a, this is an example of a ridge line, and you can actually run up and down there. I mean, almost at a full run, and it's, it's just amazing the amount of animals that use it. So here's just a sample of some of the animals that we've captured over the years. Game camera work is, it's like Christmas, especially when you have a bunch of cameras out there because you set them and then you come back a few months later and you don't know what you're going to get. You know, we haven't got a great picture of a Sasquatch yet, but we have gotten so many great pictures. Does anybody in this room, I know Chris is here, he knows, but how many people in here run game cameras or play with them? They're a lot of fun. Every once in a while you get people, but very rarely. We, we try to put our cameras way back as far from civilization as we can get them. This, when we started, we were using the Recon XRC safety cameras. They've got a very low IR, pretty much undetectable by humans. You can walk up to these things in the pitch black and it's taking your picture, but you cannot see any discernible IR. The good thing about them is their trigger speed and, and just the low IR. And this is an example of what they could do when a subject would walk by. which to me is just fantastic. And if you have a repositioned camera, you can get them on there way out as well. Okay, we started doing a lot of work uh, around Clinault about six years ago in the Ireland Lake area. We actually found and documented several tracks. Uh, these tracks were all a long ways off trail. This is a possible juvenile track. This was a 16 and a half inch track along the Ireland Lake Trail. These tracks here uh, were Fantastic. These were actually, uh, we found these on Hurstein Island over by Shelton, and there was 110 consecutive in the snow. And we got there right as the toes were melting out. The tracks were about 16 inches long, and they were between four and five feet away from each other. It was, it was pretty amazing. And if we could have got there maybe an hour earlier, they would have been absolutely pristine. But as you can see, there were still toes visible as they were melting. So we were only, I'm going to say, two or three hours behind this critter. This is a track we found up in Packwood. So this is just basically an example of some of the tracks we found over the years. That one I actually have cast. It's, the picture doesn't do it justice, but that was a Packwood cast as well. And there's Cliff from Finding Bigfoot way before the show. 
He used to go out with us and do camera work up here in the Olympics. So we got into trying to, once we started learning that we wanted to start trying to camouflage with the cameras, we got into different methods of making the cameras more disguised, more camouflaged. So I had my taxidermist come up with these. And this is a, actually a plastic that he made to look like wood. And we had some real good success with, with him as far as keeping the cameras hidden. The problem was the, the resin that they're built out of has a chemical smell. So it ended up being bare food most of the time. They'd come and just chew on and inadvertently <laughs> chew on the cameras at the same time. But they did hide the cameras well. If we could find a way to actually mask that scent better, I think it'd be pretty effective. That's my that's my twenty year old twenty year old now son hunter. Okay, this is another track. This was actually the first track. We brought Wally Hersom, our benefactor, up, and he spent a couple days up here in the Olympics with him, with us when he could still hike. And we were out on the Ireland Lake Trail on a side trail and actually found this track in his presence. So it was really cool for this the man that's been funding our research for, for years to come out and find a, ca a track in real time. And that's the track. So this is actually just this last summer. And this just gives you an idea of the vastness, you know, in the unexplored regions in the Olympics. You know, people, you always hear where they're going to hide. Well, you're looking at just a little microscopic piece of the Olympics right there. And it's, there's just so much country and land out here. It's, it's, there could be a breeding population in the Olympics and never be discovered very, very easily. And this, I thought this picture kind of captured that. This is at the base of Mount Hope Land. That's one of my brothers, John Pickering, on a trip we did last year. So anyways, I'm getting ready to get to the, the second presentation. But before you all leave, if anybody would like a shirt or a hoodie, I'm almost out of hoodies, but I do have shirts left. That's how we fund our research. All the proceeds from the shirt and hoodie sales go directly back into our research. Buys us discards for our cameras, batteries, pays for fuel so we can get out and do what we do. So come by my table if anybody would like one, we'll set you up. When we started the Olympic project, like I said, we started out as a camera trap program. Today it's evolved into something much, much different. Over the last six or seven years, I've been recruiting my favorite Bigfoot researchers into the group, along with biologists, a couple scientists, trackers, and now we have this, this fantastic unit formed. And it's turned from a camera trap project into just a, a research project. What we're doing with the Olympic project now is we're, we're focusing on a couple, three different core areas. We are documenting every piece of evidence that comes out of each area. And with this, this hyper documentation, we're starting to create patterns. And we're, we're, we're really moving forward in our opinion as far as you know, learning what these things and why these things, what they're doing and why they're doing it. And uh, we're getting some really good ideas put together. In the beginning of my Bigfoot research, I would jump all over the place and chase sightings. And now it's evolved into, we, we, we get to an area where we're quite sure that they are, and we just stay and we concentrate in that area. And we're learning things much more rapidly, which you're going to see here in a second. So again, this, these, this is the part right here that uh, if you, I just don't want to see any of these pictures on Facebook. I don't care if it's filmed, but I don't want to argue about what this is. Uh, May, year almost two years ago, we were on an expedition uh, at the west end of Lake Crescent, and I got a phone call from a past customer of mine. And my, my daytime job, I'm a landscape contractor, and I did a job about 13 years ago for a man that owns or is part owner of a gigantic lumber company, a timber company. And he calls me out of the blue May in May, and he says, uh, I've just come across something in the woods I've never seen it in my life. Now this guy, for the last 26 years, his job has been to hike through new timber or through old timber areas and survey lines for new timber cuts. So he spends four days a week for the last 26 years hiking through remote forest lands and generally in 50 to 60 year old timber cuts. And he will he will string ribbons for the new proposed cuts that are happening. So this man has come across every kind of bear den that you can imagine. He's come across beaver damage, he's come across porcupine like beds, everything you can imagine. Four years, or four days a week, 26 years. And so when he call, calls me and tells me that he's found something that he's never seen before, he instantly had my attention. 
So I arranged a meeting with him and we hiked out to this area. And what you're looking at here is, it's, it's a huckleberry bed. This area right here is about five to six feet across, squared. They're actually rounded, but about five to six feet in diameter. These are all huckleberry boughs and they're about a foot thick and they're severely depressed. Well, he found five of these in one spot. And the weird thing is, where these nests were found, there was an area about the size of this room where every single huckleberry bush in this room, in this area, had been broken four to eight feet off the ground. Not cut, not chewed, but broken. And all the pieces were imported, moved over, and these beds were formed. And so he's sitting here looking at five of these beds and going, well, what in the world is this? This is a bear. You know, I don't think it's bear. What is this? So this is how we got introduced to this area. And this area is very remote. It's two and a half miles behind the lock gate. There's no public access. And it has had almost zero human activity in 50 years. It's also situated along a ridge line right above a very heavy salmon creek. Uh, in October and November, the creek below this, about 200 yards below, you can almost walk across the salmon. As you come up the ridge to the top of the ridge line, it's nothing but huckleberry. And it's almost impenetrable. You almost have to fall through it to move through it to advance. Whoever here has done off trail hiking, you get to an area where you get like locked up and you can't move forward. That's what this whole ridge line is like. I mean, it's so thick. It's absolutely impenetrable. And then you come to an area the size of this room where every single huckleberry bush that you're viewing is just totally tore up and broken apart in these beds fashioned. In this particular area, we documented five beds. And there was scat there. and. You know, that's, that's really it. We had, we had two DNR officials come out with us to look at this, and they had never seen anything like it either. So that's kind of how this started. And he's actually given us about five years to study this area. They're going to hold off on logging so we can try to figure out what's making these beds. So in the interim, I've had two bear biologists involved. I've had a... David, what would you say... Uh, David, are you still in here? Yeah. What would you say Kelsey's title is? Yeah, David's daughter spent a lot of time in a lot of time in the Amazon studying apes and gorillas. And, uh, she's been out to the site. We've had two bear biologists involved. Both of them have said these are absolutely not bear beds, and if they are bear beds, that would be brand new documented activity. Bear will generally scrape down bark and nestle into it and, and make a bed like that. Uh, there is one bear on planet Earth that, that breaks limbs and makes a bed, but it's not even in this country. It's the sun bear. But Ursus americanus black bears do not do this. You know, they'll, they'll make a bed, but these beds are fashioned. Again, they're all consistently about a foot thick, anywhere from three feet wide to eight feet wide. And it's just like sitting in on a mattress. I mean, it was, it was just unbelievable. Pictures don't do it justice, but to see all these beds plop down. So that night I went out and I got on the internet and I started doing research. Okay, North American ground beds are ground nests, and I just racked my brain trying to figure out something that might match. What, what could it be? Could it be an otter? Could it be a, you know, a porcupine? But these beds were very big. So after two days of doing this, I finally found a direct match. And I mean a direct match, except for the foliage is different, and that's a gorilla bed. So if you, if you study African gorilla beds, it's exactly what you're looking at. You're just looking at a different type of foliage. And these beds are made, and they, I mean, they actually look exactly the same, with just a different type of foliage and they're made to give them insulation off the ground that they use in the winter months. And they build these beds, and they only, they only spend two or three nights in these beds, and then they move on. But, uh, so we're sitting here on this site now. We've got a five-year green light to study, and we're looking at five of these beds. So needless to say, we're pretty excited. We have taken three of the beds and done hair samples, and we've come back with three hairs that have come back completely unknown. Uh, Cindy Dosen is in the Olympic project and she does our hair analysis for us. Uh, she's up in Canada and she has three other samples of hair that she believes are Sasquatch hair. Three of the hairs that came out of these beds match those samples, but they're not in the gym bake, they're not known. So we're pretty excited about that as well. Sometime this summer we're going to actually try to find a way to take one of these beds out of the forest and put it over a big white, white sheet and take it apart completely and get every hair that's in it. And if we can find some good hairs, we're going to try to do some DNA testing. 
But if you saw this site, you'd understand it's not going to be easy at all. It's not even easy to get to this place. I mean, it is just so thick. So along the way, we've got these five. We went back out about two weeks later to take a couple game cameras out, and we discovered three more. So now we're up to eight, all in proximity. Well, about a month later, we went back out. Well, I'll skip ahead. So far, we've documented 20 bits, all along the same ridge line. And they're all within a third of a mile. The cool thing is, this ridge line is very consistent, and we've only explored maybe a third of it. So all the bits that you're looking at here are about the first eight. Actually, there's a couple later ones here, but as, as time's gone on, in May it will be two years since the first time we've been here. So now the beds, the green foliage is gone, and it's just the sticks. So what we're hoping to do is, as we keep going down this ridge line, we're hoping to find fresh ones again and trying to figure out what's going on. But the, the uncanny thing is, there is a serious pattern. All of these beds are, imagine you're walking through a level forest and you come to a ravine. Well, right on the edge of that ravine, is where these beds are located. It is almost impossible to get through the brush from the top to come into the backside of these beds. But once you get into the beds, there are escape routes right down into the ravine. In the ravine, at the bottom of the ravine, is a creek that's full of salmon October, November, and December. So this is the absolute perfect place to go in and eat, hike up slope, and rest without any chance of anything sneaking up on you. So there's just a serious pattern there, and as that's actually now uh, how we find these beds. We work our way down this ridge line. You look for an older growth tree, and if you get right close to the to the ridge line, that's where a bed's located. So there's there's a major pattern there. This is the initial nest site. So this kind of gives you an idea. There's the, the salmon stream below. Sorry about the rudimentary drawing here. But this, this is the first site right here after the second visit when we started documenting the positioning of the nests. It kind of goes out to a point, and then as it runs to the left there, it just kind of stays along the river. And this gets better. So down at the base, about halfway down the hill, is this fir tree. And this is a big fir tree. It's old growth size. And if you can look on this side right here, there's a sheen going up the side where you see it's kind of shiny. So we're looking at this tree, and as we're looking at it closer, we realize there is about an eight by eight foot organic nest up in the tree. Now, I don't know what this is. I'm not claiming it's a big foot bed. But apes and gorillas do this. They actually do this. They put nests up in trees like this. Now, this could be a very large bird nest. The problem I have with this being a bird nest is there's way too many crossing limbs approaching it, and flight into and flight out of this nest would be very difficult. But uh, we haven't actually gone up to investigate what's in this, but that's a, a solid eight by eight foot organic nest, and it's very sheened out on this one side of the tree. And it's way up there. I'm, I'm guessing it's probably 60 feet up in the tree. This is what's really cool. So the end nest, if you can go back to that picture, the end nest right there where you see the little sign that says knocking rocks, that end nest was about an eight foot by five foot bed right there on the ridge line. And those two little things right there are two rocks that I picked up right at the, at the base of it. And if you look at these two rocks, these rocks have a history of being banged together. They're literally scored and marked on the underneath side. And anybody in Sasquatch research knows that one of the ways we think that they communicate is either wood knocks or rock knocking. So here we are in this area that probably hasn't seen any human activity in 30, 40 years, and we find these beds and these rocks that have very recently been banged together. So there's just a few pictures here of some of the carnage. That right there is a piece of a drone, and that's probably an inch and three quarters stick. Well, you can't just walk up and break it. I mean, you can't take two arms and break it. Something walked up and just literally snapped it. This is in amongst all the blackberries that were broken apart to make these beds. This whole area, every bush that you saw, if you can imagine this room full of huckleberry bushes and every single bush being broken apart. That's what it looked like. It was just carnage in there. 
And in all of this, and all of the investigation we've done so far, there hasn't been one cut mark, and we can't find any evidence of chew marks either. So this is us setting up some cameras, David and John Dickering. David will be speaking next, I believe, David Ellis. This is David's daughter. She's the one that did so much work in the Amazon, laying in a couple of the nests, just to give you an idea. This is her laying in one of the smaller nests that we found. And if you look, behind her, right near the rear end there, you can see there's about two feet of brush. Well, that brush, that's all huckleberry, and it goes down over a foot, a foot and a half deep. This is like, they look like giant bird's nests almost. This is her laying in another one of them. Now, this is, this is several months later, and the foliage is all, the green foliage is gone. So Cliff Bear, and Finding Bigfoot, is one of my best friends I've got. And he's been out to the site, and he's pretty blown away by it. And while we were out there with him, we actually came upon another nest, one of the biggest nests that we've documented so far. It's about eight and a half by six and a half. And uh, that's Shane Corson with the Olympic Project as well, with another one of the nests. And Cliff Lang in one of them. This one here is really amazing. This is one of the bigger ones we found. It's just like sitting in a recliner. That's lift reclining. <laughs> <laughs> and you can, if you look at the brush around it, just kind of get an idea. I mean, it's just almost impossible to get through this stuff. So that's pretty much, and that right there is a gorilla bed. That's an actual gorilla bed. <laughs> And they, they, the, the beds that they fabricate are absolutely identical, just a difference in foliage. So we're not saying, I'm not sitting here trying to convince you or tell you these are Bigfoot beds. But if you look at them, and along with everything that I'm talking about here, we've also got several vocalizations. We found seven tracks in proximity. We have three unknown hairs. We have the rocks that have been beaten together. And then now we've documented 20 beds. So something's going on out there. And uh, we're not sitting here trying to ram Bigfoot down your throat, but we're getting to the point. I don't know what else it could be. I'm 100% sure it's not a bear. I'm sure it's not human. And uh, we're going we're gonna to get to the bottom of it. No matter what the answer is, we're going to figure it out. That's a really good example of the exact same type of bed, but that's a gorilla bed. One of the things that we do is two to three times a year, we host public expeditions. So we have some really talented people in the Olympic project, as far as in the biology field, in the tracking field, in the audio analysis field. And we bring in one of up and coming researchers, or researchers that have been around for a long time, and they come to our expeditions and we teach them how we do research, because we do believe we're doing it the right way. We have a very strong emphasis on proper documentation. For so many years, Bigfoot was just stories, story after story after story, with not near enough documentation. So we're, we're very stringent on doing proper documentation with anything that you find. So if you find a track out in the woods, you know, it's a great track and you can tell somebody about it, or you can document it properly and possibly learn something about it. So if we find a track in the woods, we, start, we just start going down a list, okay? What else, what's the GPS coordinates? What time of year? What's the wind doing? What's the weather doing? What direction is it traveling? Are there food sources in the area? What's the barometric pressure? All these different things, you know, if you can relate year to elevation and everything else, then you might, if you can find more tracks in that area, you might start to get an idea of why it's there. What it's doing there, is it, is it heading for water? Is it heading for cover or is it heading for food? So Bigfoot research is incredibly challenging. It's very, very hard. And the only way we're going to advance is to start documenting good evidence like crazy. Because if we can do enough documentation, then we can actually start to see patterns. And so with two of our core areas, we're deep into the pattern phase right now. Like, if I can tell you right now that in May and April, I'm going to tell you it's your best bet to look for Bigfoot in a river basin, such as the Quinal Lakes, the Hub. All the elk that are in the area come down to these areas in April and they cap. And that's where we're pretty sure that Sasquatch does feed on elk, uh, or ungulates deer too. Well, in April, May, they're having their babies and they're congregating in these river basins. Now, my favorite one's the Elwha. If you ever want to go watch elk and watch them in their natural habitat, watch giant numbers go to the Elwha in April. 
and it's also a fantastic place to track. But the reason we were starting to figure that out is because I have found the majority of the tracks I found in my life in April and May in river basins. Well, what's going on in river basins in April and May? Elk are calving. So you have huge congregations of these elk, and you not only have baby elk, you also have the sick elk. And so uh, predators kind of have a little bit of a smorgasbord there, and that's when I find, and a lot of people find the most tracks you know, are in these river basins in April and May. So that's a pattern. So we're starting to learn something right there, okay? And if you, if you get enough of these patterns put together and you start working them, I, I just think you're going to move forward quicker because Bigfoot has been stalled for so long, you know, trying to learn new stuff. Well, with this bedding area, if that's indeed what we're talking about, we're documenting some pretty incredible patterns. So and if, you, if you can take these areas and you can put all these patterns together, at some point you might be able to move over to predictability. And if we can get to the point where we can predict where a Sasquatch is going to be, we're going to be able to document one. Really document one and prove that they're real. So that's, that's what the Olympic Project's doing. That's what we're about moving forward. We try to cut all the bull crap out of research that we can. We don't, we don't, people, people kind of laugh at me. I'm a very skeptical researcher. I think probably 90% of the reports that are out there are not Bigfoot. I think so many of them are mis misinterpretation, misidentification, or just BS. And it's that, it's that 10% of accounts that keep us in. You know, not everybody lies, and somebody can go to prison on human testimony. But if that same human that puts somebody in prison with their testimony says they saw a Bigfoot, people just shake their head. So I know it's that 10% that, that we pay attention to. We try to cut through everything and keep what's good. And the other thing too is we, we kind of stick to our own area now and just do what we do. I don't don't chase sightings anymore. It just it just doesn't seem to work. So back to the expeditions. Uh, we are holding an expedition this year. The first one we're going to hold is the first weekend of May. If anybody would like to talk more about it, I'll be at the table later today. They do cost money. They're usually about three hundred and fifty bucks a person. But it is a three day event. You'll have six classes. You'll have ample day, daytime on and off trail hiking and tracking with qualified trackers. We'll have, we also do night ops like you see on Finding Bigfoot. That's not my favorite thing, but we go out and we do stuff at night with thermal imagery equipment. Uh, we teach, I'm a, I'm a licensed guide in Washington State, and I teach backpack preparedness, facing predators, wilderness survival. Uh, David Ellis teaches a track casting class. We pretty much just, and we, we usually have uh, somebody teaching uh, DNA gathering protocol, how to do things of that nature. And we ball all this stuff up into three days, so it's very active, very busy. We take good care of you, and it's a lot of fun. So if anybody would like to, to talk to me about that, feel free to wander up and talk to me about it. We, we're about half sold out, and I haven't really advertised it yet, so it's gonna go fairly quickly. We usually do two or three a year. This year we'll probably do two. One of your speakers today is Todd Nese. Also on these expeditions, we bring in a speaker or a prominent researcher from the Bigfoot world to come and give a presentation on the expedition as well. Todd's, Todd's our last speaker today, that's him there. This is Tom Baker. Tom Baker is our data analysis expert for the Olympic project. He was a Top Gun fighter pilot and a Top Gun instructor. And he was also very high up in Amazon.com. Uh, he has developed with help uh, one of the largest sighting databases in the world at this point. And he's just a wealth of information, so we also cover that on our expeditions. We do a whole lot of field time. Most of the hiking that we do is off trail. Uh, and we try to get as remote as we can, depending on people's capabilities. I love the picture. And these are, these are learning hikes. As we're hiking, we're teaching. You know, we kind of go through scenarios up on the hill, like, okay, say we're up on this ridge right here. So and so breaks his leg. What do we do? And one of the, one of the reasons that I'm so big on the wilderness survival end of it is because I do active research in the woods. If you're going to go out, how many people in here are researchers? Okay. Well, if you're if you're out in the woods and you're going to research, you're going to want to concentrate on what you're doing. But if you're out in the woods and you're worried about getting lost, finding your car, you're worried about getting attacked by a bear anything like that, then you can't do effective research. So one of the things we do is we try to take a researcher and prepare them to be in the woods. 
to not only be in the woods, but be comfortable in the woods. And we kind of ram that down your throat. We will teach you everything that you need to know. So when, while you're out there looking, you're in a relaxed state. If you're in a relaxed state, you're going to be more observant. You're going to find more stuff. And you're just going to be a way more effective researcher. So these expeditions are about half geared to getting you comfortable in the woods, along with your woods presence, being out in the woods and being calm, you know, breathing, controlling your breathing. The, the, the more you can melt into the woods, the more wildlife you're going to see, as any hunter will tell you. Uh, we do a very comprehensive track casting class. It lasts almost two hours. Uh, this is David. He goes through a chapter and verse. When you get done with this class, you're going you're gonna to know exactly how to go track a Bigfoot cast for any, any type of animal. This is just a picture from uh, our research property up there. That's Mount Mueller in the background. It's an amazing place. We actually, this is where the expedition attendees camp and we leave there with backpacks on or on horseback. And it's one of our main core, core areas. So anyways, if anybody's interested in doing that, please let me know and we'll talk further. So questions? Go ahead. Have you guys ever used dogs, tracking dogs, to you know, take on a trail with Bigfoot to see what would happen? Me personally, no. I know throughout Bigfoot research it's been tried a few times uh, with pretty mixed results. Uh, generally, if memory serves, uh, Rick Knoll over here will probably know more about that than me, but uh, dogs don't seem to be interested or don't want to go after a Bigfoot. Which is strange, right? Which is strange. Yeah. There's a whole lot of strange things about Bigfoot. <laughs> yes? Which, I'm sorry? The first set of casts. The first set of casts, the ones in the snow? Yeah. Those were only about 300 feet. Uh, actually, maybe 200 feet. That was, on, that was on an island, as a matter of fact. It's Harstein Island outside of Shelton. And that was the day after Christmas, 2010. And I was with the founder, the other founder of the Olympic Project, Rich Jermo. He was the cop, the Mason County Sheriff. He and I were together when we found those tracks. There was a uh, some people that lived on the island there, and they kept having all these weird, these weird sounds happening. They were hearing whoops and getting wood knocks. Mm -hmm. And so I actually put Barrowman from Finding Bigfoot, myself, and Rich went out and investigated. And we did some vocalizations. We got some answers right from their property. And so a couple days after that, it had snowed. And I went back up there with Rich, and that's when we found all these tracks. And it was so compelling. Because finding that many Sasquatch tracks in a row is extremely rare. Uh, Sasquatch tracks are extremely rare, real ones, extremely rare. But this, this track line was so compelling that Wally Hersom, the gentleman in the beginning, who was at the time, he was necessitating and supporting the BFRO. Well, he came in, the people were moving, and we leased their house. And we leased their house actually for six months and did a camera track program around the house. I had probably hiked 150 miles on that island. Uh, we did find tracks, both ends of the island and tracks in the middle of the island, which was pretty amazing. So we, we gave it about a year and a half effort out there. And Rich also claimed to have another sighting out there while he was setting a camera. Do you use anything to hide your human odor? Uh, because if he hits a will for you, he's out of there. Uh, I think he's out of there anyways. You know, here, here's the thing. Uh, I was having this conversation out in the other room with the gentleman. You're not going to track Bigfoot now. It's not going to happen. I don't say anything definitively about Bigfoot because there's really nothing definitive to say yet until we have species verification. But one thing I'm almost 100% sure of, you're not going to track one down. I don't think you're going to get a chance to kill one either in these dumb shows that are on TV. But uh, in order to kill one, you've got to find one. We can't seem to do that yet. So uh, I think that the majority of sightings happen when you catch them checking you out. You know, it's, it's an accident anyway. Yeah. It's a, well, I, I think it's an accident on our part, yeah. but so many of the sightings, you know, there, there's several people in this room here, Rich, Rich Noll, Richard Noll back here, myself, David, a lot of people that are here today spent years chasing sightings and, and going, going to interview people that, you know, had a sighting. And almost always, it's when you're out in the woods, you're cutting wood or you're camping or you're hunting, and you look over and there's something watching you. 
Well, think about it. You know, what, what kind of entertainment does Bigfoot have? <laughs> we have, we have almost certainly have to be its best entertainment because we have to be funny to watch. <laughs> We're the hairless ones. We're the helpless hairless ones. And Bigfoot has to have a sense of humor. You know, but if you think about it, you know, actually the most sightings that happen are from a vehicle, believe it or not. Uh, Tom has done just an amazing job with the data and with the sightings. He's picked them apart trying to, trying to come up with all these different patterns. And I wish he was supposed to be presenting here today, but he had to relocate. But uh, it's, it's amazing when you look at the different statistics. And one of the statistics that is really crazy is the most sightings have happened from a vehicle. And so we spend our time out there climbing these ridges and peeing the brush. When odds are, you have more of a chance of seeing one from your vehicle than you do in the woods. But out of all these sightings that happen, it's just time and time and time again, you're at camp, you hear something or whatever, you look over, and it's checking you out. I think the only interaction you're going to have is going to be if they're either checking you out or you get incredibly lucky, because you're not going to go looking for one and find one, in my opinion. It's just absolutely not going to happen. Yes, sir? Uh, lots of animals so far. Lots of animals. A lot of black bear, cougar, deer, ton of deer. Uh, no people, which is great. Uh, but I will say that when we when these beds were found, we found them in, in May, almost two years ago. At that time, we surmised that they were probably three months old, ish. As you saw there on the, on the slideshow, they were still mostly green, starting to die off. At this point, out of the 20 beds that we have found, we haven't found any new ones yet. And the 20 that we have found all appear to be the same age. So, uh, what was your question again? I'm sorry, I went off. Whether the camera had results from. The yeah, yeah, well, yes, but just the animals. Uh, they, they apparently, whatever's making these nests, have not come back through yet. So, again, though, this is a very long ridge line. And we have maybe, we have maybe discovered about a third of it. it it's just so, it's so time consuming to explore this area. I fully expect to find another 20 or 30 beds at the rate it's going. Because as we progress down this ridge line, you go a couple hundred yards and there's two more. What about the sound run? So if they, they're feeding on, wouldn't that be a time to have the camera out? It is, and we did. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but in this particular area, which is in the foothills of the Olympics, there are several ravines that are identical to this. Uh, you know, I have a lot of theory, or a lot of hypothesis that. That's all they are. I think that there is a group that's using this area, and I think that they're, they, they target these different ravines. Maybe there's a chance that they know that we're in there. Maybe we've blown our cover, I'm not sure. Uh, one thing we are doing this time differently than what we used to do is we're taking our time. We used to just kind of run in and canvas the area with cameras and get crazy and put somebody in a tree with night vision, all this crap. We don't, we're not doing that. We're trying to, when I go into this area, I do it in the rain, and I do one scent, or I descent, and we go in there, we, we don't go in when it's sunny or anything like that. We, we're, we're going in very quietly, very mildly, trying to have as little of an impact as we can. And maybe this is a third year rotation ravine. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. So, next. Yes, sir. Um, there are tribes out there that believe that these are a tribe of people. Mm -hmm. And their generations go back for I don't know how many years that they've, they've seen these things. And your question is? Do you believe that it's possible they're a tribe of people? Anything's possible. I, I, I believe that, that it, it seems to me that they're somewhat human. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm, I, I would tend to look a little more at the per human aspect, more than just an ape. I think if it was just an ape, I think this, this story would be over. I think we'd be done. Uh, I, I firmly believe that these are very, very intelligent critters. One thing about Sasquatch, uh, I'm glad you brought this up, because I like to talk about this. One thing that is amazing is they have the most uncanny ability to get incredibly close to you without revealing themselves. And it's happened to me, it's happened to my wife, it's happened to several of my friends, to where you'll hear one bum rushing you, coming up on you, and right before they step out and reveal themselves, they stop. And you'll even hear them breathing. And it's, it's, it's like an underwear changing moment. <laughs> and how far back did the generations of the, the Indians have been reporting these for thousands of years? Uh, hundreds of years? Uh, I, would, I would say at least hundreds. Yeah. 
But they, again, I, I want to emphasize, there is, they have this ability or this knowledge. They know not to reveal themselves to us. Okay, like if you're driving along a highway, you can, look, you can look over and see a bull moose standing in a creek, or you can see a bear out in the meadow, but you're not going to see a Sasquatch out there. Why? Why do they, why do they know to stay away from us? And how, how are they so smart to know they can get right up on you, and you can get their tracks, you can get physical evidence, you can know they were there, but they won't show themselves. And it's just, it's a huge mystery. It's just very intriguing, trying to figure it out. Next. Yes, sir. About uh, migration. Possibly, and I, I, I don't know. Uh, I think that they, I think they use the topography to their advantage. I think they use a range to their advantage. I think they'll come into an elk calving area to feed in April and May. I think they will stay next to salmon rivers when the salmon are in them. I think that they, will, you'll find them concentrated in berry fields in August, where the berries are thick. I think that, I think that they move with purpose. And I don't think they burn a lot of calories for doing something that isn't mandatory for their existence. Uh, it seems seems to me that they're very deliberate. You know, and I, I think that they're just going to go where they need to go to satisfy whatever need it is that they have while staying hidden. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. One was, uh, you said you found scat in the bedding areas that comes back unknown. Well, generally scat comes back unknown anyways because it's really, really hard to get DNA off of. Scat. Yeah. You, you can look and see what's, what it's been eating. The other question was on um, the bedding, you find north slopes, east slopes, west slopes, find it uh, in chaotic weather, in weather. Well, this is the south side, this particular one. Uh, that's what's so amazing about this, to me at least, because there have been a couple sporadic beds found in Bigfoot research over the years, but nothing like this not this kind of multiples of this type of nest or bed. Uh, so I'm not sure what we're dealing with yet. Uh, I would, it's just like if you're on, you know, one of the things I teach with the wilderness survival is woods navigation without a compass or without a GPS and how to identify where you're at depending on the foliage that's on any given ridge. Because if anybody spending time in the woods, if you're walking down a ridge line, you have a north slope and a south slope. The south slope is full of foliage. The north slope is like the dead zone. There's nothing there. And so most, most Bigfoot evidence that I have found and the people that I work with have found have always been on western or southern slopes, predominantly. There are some questions for oh, you. Yes. Um, so what's your opinion of the camera traps and why is this animal so elusive to the cameras? Are they spiritual? I mean, it seems like everybody out there has got cameras all over the place. But okay. still cannot get a definitive Okay, first and foremost, no, there are not cameras all over the place. <laughs> not even close. That is, that's a misnomer. That's, that's something people say all the time. But there are not cameras all over the place. There is a microscopic amount of cameras out there, believe it or not. And most of these cameras are located closer to populations, to people. It's just like the stick structures. Uh, most of the stick structures that I have come across, I don't pay any attention to them. There's a lot of people here that probably do. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but until I see a Sasquatch making a stick structure, I'm not going to spend my time worrying about it or thinking about it because a lot of the stuff happens naturally in the woods, and a lot of people build them just to build them or to throw off the researchers or whatever. But as far as camera traps go, I don't think there's any. I don't think there's anything. I don't think that they sense the camera or anything like that. I just believe that there are very few Sasquatch. And if a camera is obvious, you know when you walk into your living room. And if you keep your house neat, you walk in and somebody has moved the television remote, that's the very first thing your eye goes to. Yep. You just key on that. Well, if you live out in the woods and you live in a core area, if you walk through there and you see something unnatural, you're going to key on it instantly and maybe avoid it, possibly avoid it. So that avoidance, I think, does happen. People always say, does the IR flash scare them off? Well, if the IR flash is happening, the picture's happening. So you'd you have the picture anyways. So I, I just think, to me personally, and I could be 100% wrong, I think it speaks to numbers. I just think it speaks to numbers, and I don't think we're putting the traps in the right places. Yet. What uh, percentage of the research community have concluded that they could have the capability in visibility? Uh, not the people I work with. I, I don't believe in any of that. I could be wrong. I don't know anything definitively at all. 
but uh, that's, that's not the direction that our research takes us. In my opinion, I'll get more unpopular here real quick. In my opinion, I think a lot of people get very frustrated with this research because it is uber challenging. You go out for two or three or four years and you're banging your head up again. And I think it's really easy to start letting things come into your brain, excuses, if you will, of why. And then, and then all of a sudden Bigfoot starts having all these powers and that helps explain why you haven't found anything. And again, I'm not trying to offend anybody, that's my own personal opinion. But no, I don't believe they have any, any, any of those. Me personally, I don't think so. Yes, ma'am. Not a clue. I would guess 40 years. What's the oh, question? yes, I have nothing, nothing to go by on that, just a guess. What was the question? Lifespan. <laughs> Two more questions. Yes, sir. What do you feel is their strongest sense? I would say sight. Sight? <laughs> and I do. Yeah, we do employ that. Yeah, I mean, wind, wind is everything. And even for something that doesn't smell really good, wind is still everything. You know? And if you're a hunter, which all of us are at least into the art of hunting, wind is first. You know, I, I, obviously you know, but yeah, if you're not playing with the wind correctly, you're not going to get anywhere. One more question, please. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I had a question. I'm new to the Bigfoot community, and I was wondering, where's the best place to start looking for evidence or searching for Bigfoot? Where do you live? Uh, in this area, Longview. This area has actually had a lot of sightings. A whole lot. Uh, I, I don't think it's going to behoove you to go to popular Bigfoot spots. If you go to an area with abundant wildlife, a decent bear population, a good food source, a good cover source, and a good water source. You have just a good chance there is anywhere. Uh, we're very partial to the Olympics. Uh, I love the Olympics, and we spend most of our time on the north side of the Olympics, but the east side of the Olympics is fantastic as well. Anywhere around Lake Cushman, Lake Crescent, Salduck, Elwak, Wanal, Queets, Ho, any of those areas are fantastic in my opinion. I gotta get out of here. Thank you so much. Thank you.